from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually to meet workforce demands and grow West Virginia's economy. Learn more at wvhepc.edu. The W. Page Pitt School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Marshall University, providing hands-on education in advertising, public relations, and journalism across all media platforms. At the legislature today, senators begin to dig into legislation to restructure the state's tax code. That after receiving word that its implementation could result in a major loss of revenue. In the House, delegates debate bills to expand access to health care in the state. And we focus in on what's happening at the state house to aid victims of sexual assault and rape. Those stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. The state of West Virginia's budget has largely been the focus of this legislative session, overshadowing many of the other bills making their way through the process. Several bills, though, have been introduced to aid the victims of rape and sexual assault in the state. Our guests tonight are backing those efforts. Senator Mike Wofel is a Democrat from Cabell County. He's the sponsor of several of these bills in the Senate. And Nancy Hoffman is the state coordinator of the West Virginia Foundation for Rape and Information Services. Thank you both for being here tonight. Thank you. And Nancy, let's start with you. The West Virginia Foundation for Rape Information and Services. Tell me what your organization does. We are the state sexual assault coalition. We've been in service to the state for 35 years now, and our mission is to focus on intervention and prevention services to sexual assault victims in the state. We do that through training, technical assistance with allied professionals, prosecution, law enforcement, college campuses, medical facilities, as well as help support 10 rape crisis centers that are regionally providing services to victims. And your organization is asking lawmakers to consider several pieces of legislation this session, and Senator Wofel has decided to sponsor many of those bills. So why don't we start with Senate Bill 69, the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. Senator, you say that this bill is similar similar to a piece of legislation that federal lawmakers put into place. It is. I saw that the Congress had passed uh, the Federal Bill of Rights for Sexual Assault Victims, and so we mirrored that. Um, and just by way of example, the woman has, a, has an opportunity to have a crisis counselor available to her. She's entitled to a free forensic exam, medical exam. So a lot of women are still charged for that. Hmm. and. Our, our state, in, in my view, doesn't really treat our victims of sexual violence very well. Uh, and to show you the breadth of the problem, a uh, recent survey last month from West Virginia University, one in three female co-eds uh, reported having been sexually assaulted at WVU. So it's a broader problem than the public may think and our system is fairly outdated and it needs modernization. Nancy, the senator mentioned a couple of things that the bill does. It allows them to have somebody with them at the hospital during this exam. It says that the exam has to be free of charge for these survivors. You know, why do we need this piece of legislation in the state? It is frustrating, it's a great question. Sexual assault's a felony, so it's a crime against the state, but the focus has tended to be on the criminal justice component of the crime and not on the victim. For example, the forensic evidence component. A victim's body is often the crime scene, and a victim shouldn't have to pay to have that evidence collected. So one component of that Bill of Rights is that they would not be charged for that forensic exam. We also know in our state that one in six women and one in 22 men will be victims of a forcible or completed rape or, or attempted rape. So it's important for us to provide support to victims so they'll come forward and report a sexual assault. 
Nationally, our statistics show that only about a third of victims actually report being sexually assaulted. So for them to report, they need to have the support from the criminal justice system with a focus not just on the crime, but also on their needs as well. Well, that leads us to the next bill, Senate Bill 167, which deals with the kits that are actually collected at hospitals after these crimes. Um, but Senate Bill 167 is not dealing with, it's, it's trying to address the backlog, but not necessarily with the untested kits that we hear about all the time. But Nancy, you say with the unsubmitted kits. Can you tell us about this bill? Yes, sir. there's a different in the def difference in the definitions between unsubmitted kits and untested kits. Untested kits are those that were collected, but they were, and they were submitted to the uh, lab for testing. They just haven't been tested yet. The, those are the untested kits. Mm -hmm. The unsubmitted kits are those that were collected, but for whatever reason were never submitted for testing. So we have a, a pilot project in our state right now that has received funding that is going to um, test all of the unsubmitted kits in the state. But we need to have a process so that we don't get to this point again where we have over a thousand unsubmitted kits. So this is setting forth a protocol for the future, for the testing and the submission of these kits. But Senator, this bill also kind of secondarily opens up who can actually perform those tests, correct? Right, at this point in, in our state, you're guaranteed about a year delay between an actual sexual assault, the forensic rape, rape kit, you know, being taken and a result from the state police lab. So you have many victims who want to really put that in the rear view mirror and prosecutions just don't occur. So what this would do, it would open up our state police crime lab, could delegate other labs such as the Marshall University Forensic Lab or the lab in Morgantown uh, uh, to perform these tests in a timely manner. Personally, I think it should be 60 days, but what this bill does is, is it allows the legislature to set up rulemaking and determine uh, what proper guidelines or protocols should be put in place. So the bill doesn't do that, but it allows a deliberation in terms of listening to the various experts to make sure that what we do establish will work. So I want to get to one last bill very quickly, Nancy, and that's a bill that's going to be voted on in the Senate tomorrow about human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly tell us why this bill is important? We do have a statute now outlawing human trafficking in the state, but there are just some components of it that um, will be clarified and some protections added to the bill. Um, it adds more felony offenses. It adds an offense for someone who patronizes a victim who has been a victim of sex trafficking. It creates criminal immunity for the victim. Uh, from being charged from, with prostitution, and it also allows for restitution to victims. That bill up for a vote in the Senate tomorrow. Nancy Hoffman and Senator Mike Wolfel, thanks Thank so you. much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. The state's Department of Revenue announced today that tax collections for the month of February exceeded revenue estimates for the first time this fiscal year. While that may sound like good news, the state is still lagging behind those estimates by a total of $123 million and will need to find that money by June. Governor Jim Justice announced last week he'd look to one-time monies in state agency accounts to close the gap instead of the state's rainy day fund. That would prevent another potential downgrade of the state's bond rating, which is essentially the state's credit score. In the Senate, members of the Select Committee on Tax Reform are still mulling over a bill to make substantial changes to the state's tax structure, all in the name of inciting economic growth. Committee members for the first met for the first time this morning since receiving revenue estimates for their bill to repeal the personal income tax. That's followed up by uh, de revenue decreases in the out years that seems to peak in the neighborhood of about $600 million after about three years. Mark Muco is the Deputy Secretary for the State Department of Revenue. Muco was responsible for writing the fiscal note attached to Senate Bill 335, a bill that would repeal the state's personal income tax and replace it with an 8% general consumption tax on most goods and services. Muco explained to members of the Select Committee on Tax Reform Monday that initially the bill would result in a revenue increase for the state of about $550 million in 2018. That's because the bill's tax increase 
increases would take effect on July 1st of this year, and the income tax repeal wouldn't occur until January 1st of next year. Still, Mucow says by 2021, the legislation in its current state would result in a $610 million loss in revenue. Uh, of course, that $600 million would be on top of the three or $400 million shortfall we have this year, so it would be about a billion dollars short. MUCO's estimates were released late last week, but today was the first time lawmakers discussed them. Despite what could be considered a blow to the proposal, some senators were encouraged by the fiscal note's findings. I like see Republican in it, Senator Ed and Gaunt what I was of afraid Trump of County. when we asked for it was that we'd get a pie-in-the-sky uh, uh, review that, that made us all think, wow, why, why shouldn't we go ahead with this right now? And what I see is a very thoughtful, uh, maybe not worst case scenario, but certainly um, realistic scenario. But his feelings weren't shared by all of the seven committee members, like Democratic Senator Bob Plymel from Wayne County. He says the bill's implications could be devastating for the border region he represents. Although it would give West Virginians a break on their personal income taxes, the bill's 8 percent general consumption tax would apply to a number of goods and services, groceries, haircuts, accounting services that Plymouth says residents in his area could go to Kentucky or Ohio for, significantly impacting the state's income. I think somebody said the other day that this was the most dramatic change of uh, tax reform that they've ever seen in one uh, bill. That someone was Mark Muco, who made the comment in his written fiscal note. Muco advised members of the committee to take time to study the bill's impact, something he says would take a significant amount of time and could not be completed in the 30 days left in this legislative session. Republican Senator Robert Carnes is the lead sponsor of the bill and the committee's chair. He was also a member of House Speaker Tim Armstead and former Senate President Bill Cole's two-year tax reform study group, an effort that resulted in little to no changes to the state's tax code. Over the last 30 years, we've had numerous studies, and those studies always wind up essentially getting stuck in a drawer somewhere and, and forgotten about until the next study. Carnes the says the revenue estimates for Senate Bill 335 didn't come as a surprise to him, but he's not interested in studying it any further. It's been since the mid-80s that we've actually had a serious major tax reform in West Virginia. So 30 years, and in that intervening time, we've had at least three other major tax reform studies, not counting the one we just completed, so at a certain point, you have to go from studying to doing, and it's time to start doing something for West Virginia. Karn says it's now time for the committee to adjust the bill and its tax restructuring measures to assure the bill can be revenue neutral, not result in any losses of state revenue, but not create any new ones either. For Carnes, that means instead of getting rid of the personal income tax in one fell swoop, the bill may instead phase the income tax out, attaching future reductions in the rates to the state's economic gains and the size of its rainy day fund. As revenues increase, the income tax automatically steps down, but only if revenues increase. And that way it's, it's not a risk to our budget. Uh, because the money has to be there for those step downs to occur. A similar measure was put into place to reduce the state's corporate net income tax several years ago. And Mucow says those types of triggers can work. But he still does not believe the tax rates in the bill can offset the revenue that would be lost when West Virginians cross the border to buy groceries or hire an attorney. The 8% sales tax in the bill would give West Virginia the highest rate in the country, he says. And even though it's been 30 years since the state's last tax reform efforts of the 1980s, Mucow says change tax. is not always the West best Virginia thing. Has, uh, I call West Virginia the tax reform state. No state has changed its tax laws as often as we have. And that creates a lot of instability, which makes also makes it a little bit difficult to do business. Mucow says the state's history of revenue problems is linked to West Virginia's extremely low property tax rates, taxes that can only be changed through a constitutional amendment that would need approval by the voters. That issue, Mucow says, is only exacerbated by the fact that the state provides almost all of the services West Virginians rely on, like public schools and road paving, while in other states, those services tend to be taken care of at a larger amount at the local level. On the chamber floor today, senators approved a bill that would remove certain wage protections for employees in what Democrats describe as vulnerable industries in the state. The bill is an attempt by its sponsors to allow small business owners easier entry into those same fields.
Senate Bill 224 is one of several measures being pushed through the West Virginia Senate this session that affect laborers in the state. The bill removes a decades-old requirement for employers in the construction and mineral extraction industries to put up a wage bond. Wage bonds are money an employer pays to the state to cover the cost of employee wages and benefits for a month should the business close. They're a security for workers and have to be funded by the company for its first five years in operation. Senate Judiciary Chair Charles Trump says according to the State Division of Labor, the bonds have been used to pay workers 40 times during the past 10 years, an average of four times a year. But he says the state doesn't know how many businesses never opened because they couldn't afford the bond. It is not rational and I believe it is an impediment to the growth and fostering and encouragement of the opening of businesses in West Virginia. Three of West Virginia's bordering states, Ohio, Pennsylvania and Virginia, do not require a wage bond, according to Trump. But the Putnam Senate County Republican Democratic Senator Harris Glenn Jeffrey says those states state don't rely on extraction industries like West Virginia and Kentucky do. And Kentucky's bond also requires four weeks worth of payroll be bonded for the first five years of a construction or extraction company's operation. Jeffrey says he wishes the state could expand the bonding requirement to every industry. But we don't need to because the other businesses, they're not as vulnerable as what construction and mining is. Jeffries owns his own construction company and opposes extraction getting rid of the bonding industry. requirement. He says there were opportunities to make the bill better Senate for business in the state, but no one who opposed the legislation came to lawmakers during the committee process. We could amend the, this bill and protect the workers and maybe ease, ease the burden on some of the, of the employers. We could amend the law to apply more narrowly to out-of-state contractors. But we didn't. Democratic Senator Mike Romano of Harrison County also opposed the bill because he says it removes a protection for a class of workers in particular who tend to be the focus of debates over both politics and policy. We talk about helping our coal miners in here every day. We talk about the federal regulation that's hurting our coal miners. We talk about the environmental regulations hurting our coal miners, and here we are taking money out of coal miners' pockets. We profess we care so much about them. We need to do it not just when it's to our political advantage. We need to actually stay up for them. Stand up for them and stand up for their families. But while Democratic opposition remained focused on the implications for workers, Republicans focused on businesses, including Senator Jeff Mullins from Raleigh County. Mullins says potential business owners must have impeccable credit to have the wage bonds covered by creditors, like banks. Otherwise, they have to find sometimes tens of thousands of dollars up front to cover the cost. So what I think this does, this helps the little guy, the guy that... Uh, wants to start a uh, little construction company to build houses. The guy that's barely getting by and, uh, uh, you know, he don't have the money to put up a wage bond. Uh, so to me, the wage bond helps people that have money. It doesn't help the little guy. Trump agreed, really pushing the, the potential benefits for the overall economy. I believe that if we pass this bill and eliminate this requirement and remove this barrier to entry in construction and mining, that it will have a positive effect. I think we will see more entry into the market and thereby create, create the jobs for our citizens that we don't have now. Senators approved the bill 21 to 12 on a party line vote, with one member of the chamber absent. The bill now goes to the House of Delegates for further debate. Delegates continue to work through bills they hope will impact both the quality of and access to health care in West Virginia. Liz McCormick details two of those bills that were put to a vote on the chamber floor today. 
In West Virginia, if someone wants to open up a hospital, clinic, or health-related facility, he or she has to file for a certificate of need with the West Virginia Health Care Authority. The certificate of need process is meant to reduce the inflation of health care costs. If too many hospitals or clinics providing similar services are built in the same area, health care providers may hike right, the prices of their services to make up for their lack of customers. CONs try to prevent that from happening by limiting the number of services provided in a region. Members of the House are are attempting to clean up the certificate process through House Bill 2459. Delegate Matthew Rohrbach, a Republican from Cabell County, is a sponsor of the bill. He says two bills have been introduced into the Senate this session to completely remove the certificate of need process, eliminating the West Virginia Health Care Authority. As a doctor, Rohrbach says removing the process would be bad for West Virginia. Some states have done away with CON. They are bordering us. And unfortunately, that's created an unfair advantage for some of our border states against our local hospitals that are providing care to our patients and they're employing our citizens. In Pennsylvania in particular, they've had a lot of problems when they dropped their CON with the expansion of services, the volumes have went down and they've had some quality problems. While neither of the Senate bills have been considered by the Senate's Health and Human Resources Committee yet, Rohrbeck calls the House bill a fair compromise that balances health care access for rural communities with the quality of service provided. The bill passed 98 to 1 and moves on to the Senate. The second health-related bill delegates considered Monday is House Bill 2509, which has to do with telemedicine. The bill allows for physicians to prescribe certain controlled substances through telemedicine technologies, like over a video call. Delegate Amy Summers of Taylor County is the vice chair of the House Health Committee. She explained to members that currently physicians are not able to prescribe some medication through the telemedicine system, but the bill would not permit a doctor to prescribe narcotics like oxycodone or morphine, drugs that have been abused in recent years in West Virginia. This is a bill that will increase the availability of treatment options for West Virginia patients by West Virginia physicians who live a great distance from the doctor's office. Delegate Marty Gearhart, a Republican from Mercer County, asked Summers for examples of some controlled substances that would be allowed to be prescribed over video chat. She said Xanax or Valium could be possible medications. My question though is, and, and I'm ignorant when it comes to drugs, so you'll, you'll have to help me a little bit, but are these things that have addictive properties that may in fact Xanax a, a does require problem? Xanax does require a weaning process to come off of it, so I would have to say yes. Okay. Delegate Rohrbach says while curbing the state's opioid epidemic is a major focus for lawmakers, this specific bill does not affect those efforts. He says instead it focuses on allowing doctors to prescribe medications for behavioral or mental health issues. We have a tremendous problem with access to mental health providers, particularly for our pediatric population. So uh, ADHD is the main thing that this is going to seek to close. So kids that have ADHD can be treated via telehealth to get their Adderall and other prescriptions for such. So this is not to allow pill mills. This is really to extend for our mental health providers a way to service our clients in rural areas. The bill passed 95 to 4. It now heads to the upper chamber for further consideration. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. We meet a few more members of the 83rd West Virginia Legislature tonight in this edition of Meet Your Lawmakers. Ed Gaunch was elected to the state Senate in 2014. He's a Republican from Kanawha County representing the 8th Senatorial District. Senator Gaunch chairs the Committees on Banking and Insurance and Pensions and serves as the Vice Chair of the Committee on Enrolled Bills and Government Organization. Tony Painter is a first-term member of the House of Delegates, elected in 2016. He's a Republican representing the 25th District. Painter is from Wyoming County. Ed Evans is a Democrat from McDowell County. He represents the House's 26th District and was elected in 2016. Evans is a retired educator and a graduate of Glenville State College. 
Tomorrow on our show, we focus in on the many education bills making their way through the State House. West Virginia Superintendent of Schools Dr. Michael Martirano joins us to discuss potential changes to testing requirements and the assessments of the state's public schools. Members of the House will be debating a bill to increase the penalties for transporting drugs. And in the Senate, the Chamber will put a bill to a vote that limits the amount of money employers and unions can use for political activity. You can watch lawmakers debate and vote on those bills live tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. on the West Virginia Channel or streaming live on our website at wvpublic.org. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually to meet workforce demands and grow West Virginia's economy. Learn more at wvhepc.edu. The W. Page Pitt School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Marshall University, providing hands-on education in advertising, public relations, and journalism across all media platforms. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.